Okay, we can start. It's four now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, How Times Higher Education Rank Universities in the Middle East Africa. My name is Nadine Salah. I'm the marketing manager at Emerald Publishing for the Middle East Africa, uh, Turkey, and Pakistan. First, I'd like to start with some housekeeping notes. Uh, this webinar is recorded and will, and will be later uploaded on our YouTube channel. It will last for one hour. Uh, if you'd like to ask questions along the way, please feel free to put them in the question panel, which you will find on your right-hand side of the screen on the GoToWebinar uh, viewer. Let's have a look at our agenda. We are joined today by three speakers from Times Higher Education. So let's welcome uh, Nick Davis, who is the president for Middle East Africa at Times Higher Education. He joined in 2015, and he has more than eight years of experience working in the higher education. And hold on. Uh, working in the higher education and more than uh, four years managing the region. Lukas Dutley, who is the regional director for the Middle East, he joined Times Higher Education in 2020. Uh, and he has more than, I can't see from the, hold on. He has more than uh, two years, correct me, Lukas, if I'm wrong, I can't read. 10 uh, years, open. 10 years of experience in higher, in higher uh, education. Years, sorry, in the education sector, sorry. yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, more than two working with Times Higher Education and Lubab Al Wazir, who is the product owner from the rankings team. She joined Times Higher Education in 2020. She has two years of experience working in the rankings department and she previously interned at the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia in Lebanon. Please welcome our speakers, everyone. I'd like to thank Nick, Lukash, and Lubaba for, for conducting the webinar, for giving them uh, time and effort into, into the presentation and into uh, this webinar. Thank you. So let's dive into the agenda. Um, I know that most of the attendants probably know about Emerald Publishing and Times Higher Education, so we will give uh, a brief introduction. So Emerald Publishing is a global publisher with over 50 years uh, of experience in the field. These are a few uh, stats uh, about Emerald as a publisher. We signed with Dora back in 2019. And we have a product that covers uh, about 15 subject areas, uh, journals, ebooks, expert briefings, and cases. And some of our subject areas are accounting, finance and economics, business and management, education, marketing, just to name a few. You will find QR codes under each product that upon scanning, it will um, direct you to our website in which you will be free to navigate through each product freely. We also host um, many regional and global competitions, which you will find their announcements on our Facebook page. So please make sure to follow our page, which you will also find the QR code for it and the link for it for our Facebook page to know all about, all about our um, announcements and collaborations. And I'll be giving the floor now to uh, Nick. Thank you so much, Nadine, and thank you to everyone at Emerald Publishing for uh, inviting us along today. And of course, to everyone joining us online. Um, so I have the very easy job of providing a very quick introduction to the Times Higher Education. Hopefully most of you know a little bit about us and probably know a bit about our rankings, but I'll give you a bit of a company overview and I'll then be handing over to Lubaba, one of our rankings experts. Um, I think she's going to tackle some of the questions that we had from you uh, through the presentation and then we'll open up to, to a Q&A towards the end. So a quick company overview of THE. We've been around for 52 years now. Um, and if you can see in the bottom left corner, that's what we looked like back in 1971. We were a small supplement out of the Times of London newspaper. Um, and to be completely honest, for the first 35, 40 years perhaps of our existence, that was what we did. 
we published editorial content, we made comments on higher education both in the UK and around the world, but that was pretty much it. And it wasn't really until a gentleman by the name of Phil Beatty thought, well, why don't we produce a ranking of university that our business started to change? And with that change, changed our business priorities as well. And you can see here are three mission statements as Times Higher Education. Um, and they speak to the three core stakeholder groups that we work for. So the first to help universities understand their position against their mission. And that's the really important part, their mission. We know not every university is the same. Not every university wants to be an Oxford, a Harvard, a Cambridge. They each have their own mission. And the data that sits behind our rankings is what enables THE to help universities towards their distinct mission. The second, to help students find and access the university best suited to their abilities and aspirations. It's very easy to go to any global rankings and think, well, I want to go to the number one university in the world, but is it right for you? So 2021 saw the advent of THE's student proposition come to life. Uh, and that's really where we try to give students as much information as possible to make the right decisions about their academic future. And finally, to help higher education deliver transformational teaching, research and innovation. And this really speaks to the work that we've been doing with governments, with ministries um, uh, and the like over the past few years to help them look beyond the rankings and to the underlying data to help make the right decisions for their higher education sectors. And this really speaks to the solutions that we offer to universities, to governments, um, everything from our powerful data tools, which I think we'll touch on later on, through branding and consultancy solutions, and to our events. And uh, we hope that hearing our team speak today will encourage you to come along to some of our events in the very near future. We're often asked why uh, universities should participate in rankings and we think that there are four pretty good reasons for doing so um, and Lubaba I think will show us them on the on the next slide. They really speak to visibility so universities being visible on the global stage making a name for themselves and publicizing what's great about them collaboration, building that collaboration with international partners, whether in industry, in other universities or in government um, to achieve their missions. The recruitment of international faculty and students as well is a core driver for the production of our rankings. And of course, benchmarking as well. So understanding your position within your regional or global rankings. So as I said, Lubaba is going to take us through uh, the rankings in more detail, um, but these broadly fall into three categories. Our teaching rankings, which are always done at a national or regional level. You can see the Wall Street Journal THE college rankings for the US and Japan university rankings as well. Our research focused rankings, um, and it's very important to remember that our world university rankings are research focused. These are our rankings to recognize research led universities. And that's why we include that participation threshold of 1000 papers over five years. And finally, our sustainability rankings, the impact rankings released for the first time in 2019, based on the UN SDGs, all 17 of them, uh, and another way to recognize the university's fourth mission. So, Lubaba, with, uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to you and thank you once again, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Nick, and again, thanks everyone for joining. Um, with this presentation, uh, I think in the next sections, I'll be covering some of the questions that uh, you have raised when you registered, but also um, generally uh, information about the rankings offered that are relevant to the Middle East and Africa region and how to take part in these rankings. So to start, uh, we can talk about THE's flagship and oldest ranking, the World University Rankings, which, as Nick mentioned, is really focused on research uh, and research in intensive universities. Um, the ranking has been around for many years and it judges universities across their traditional core missions, uh, from teaching to research environment and quality 
to industry and knowledge transfer. And finally, we also consider international outlook. In order to assess these missions, we look at three types of data. First of all, we consider performance data collected directly from universities regarding their um, uh, numerical uh, uh, basically data on staff, students, graduation, and finance. We also consider reputation data. What are, how do these universities perform in terms of reputation globally? And this is collected through a survey that we run annually uh, directly to academics that are published and cited in their fields to ask their, for their opinions on these universities. And finally, our third major data source is bibliometric data, which uh, sources data on publications and citations from uh, our partner Elsevier Scopus database. Uh, over the years, the ranking has grown, and we're going to look at that um, more in more details in a little bit. Uh, but we know that recently, and in the latest rankings, we had over 2,500 universities from across 110 countries and regions submit data to the rankings. Uh, so our database of uh, regarding these missions is really increasing over the years. Now, as um, mentioned, since this is a research intensive rankings, we do have a set of eligibility criteria to make sure that we have sufficient data to really assess that performance. Um, and that includes uh, teaching at the undergraduate level producing at least a thousand publications over the past five years with 150 publications each year and finally being a university that publishes across the subject rather than specializing in one particular subject. Now even if your institution is uh, specialized in let's say medical or engineering or certain subjects you might still be uh, eligible for the rankings uh, but you just need to, of course, like let us know and we will look at that case. Um, the question that came across regarding eligibility as well is whether there are certain accreditations that we require. And I can confirm that there is no accreditations in particular that we require, but we do need universities to be fully recognized as higher education institutions in their respective countries and regions. So that could be through your own Ministry of Education or the respective um, accreditation agencies in your own regions. The Royal University rankings uh, are very detailed, include a lot of data, and they do allow us to assess missions in certain regions of the world and to lead to certain rankings that are focused on specific groups. Um, so some of these rankings that might be relevant to you are the Arab rankings, um, which assess uh, universities in the Arab region based on a similar set of metrics as the world. So we look at, again, the five core missions of teaching, research, industry, and internationalization. But we alter the weightings of these metrics to reflect the specific features of the Arab world. And we also add some metrics that are specifically relevant to that region. So for example, for the Arab university rankings, we have a metric that considers collaboration in research within the Arab world. We also look at the university's performance in sustainable development goals as part of this rankings. We have a slightly less strict eligibility criteria for the Arab ranking. So we accept universities with at least 500 publications over the past five years. And we also uh, accept participation from universities that only offer postgraduate edu education. Another relevant rankings that is also uh, relevant or directly relevant to the world is the young university rankings. So we also consider uh, universities across those five missions, but with a particular focus on the needs and the features of universities that are considered young. And by our definition, this is universities that are founded within the past 50 years. In order to be eligible for the young university rankings, universities need to be uh, also eligible for the work so they must follow the same eligibility criteria now some of the ways that this ranking is tailored for younger universities is by putting less focus on reputation scores which usually tend to be higher with universities with older history and rather we focus more on resources and income uh, which are a better way to measure how well young universities are performing 
And finally, we have the Asia University rankings, which similarly also puts less focus on reputation and considers uh, metrics that are more appropriate for Asian universities with higher weightings, such as research environment, industry collaborations, and knowledge transfer. The participation rules also include being eligible for the WHERE and being located in the Asian continent. And now I know that sounds like a lot of rankings, but the good news is that you only need to submit data once to be considered for all of these rankings. Um, and in order to do that, uh, we ask universities to nominate a contact at the institution that will be responsible for collecting data and submitting it through our data collection portal. This contact is usually someone who could be working at the library, at the institutional research department, if you have one. Uh, sometimes it could be a contact at the international relations department. It really, depend, it really depends on your own institution and what department that is most relevant and has the most data. So that could be decided by your institution, but it needs to be a contact that is authorized by the university to submit data on your behalf. Once your institution has that contact, they can email it to us at profilerankings at timeshighereducation.com and we will set up access for the portal. Um, now you can see that we have email addresses uh, which you might need later on. You have the option to opt in for further email communications as part of this webinar. And if you do, we're gonna share the slides with you which will contain all the relevant email addresses and resources. Now, once a data provider is set up and they have access to the portal, they can uh, connect to the portal and provide data. For the World University Rankings and all the derivatives that I've mentioned in the previous slide, we open one data collection, usually between early January and late March of every year. And in order to be considered, you would need to be submitting data in that period. Uh, data collected, as mentioned, includes data on staff, students, uh, degrees, income, uh, and it's also collected for the overall university. So we collect data for the entire university, but also we request that you submit data broken down by subject. Finally, once this data is submitted, your institution will be considered for the world university rankings and the other rankings that you might be eligible for. Now, one thing I uh, did not include because it also can be very detailed is our subject rankings, which are also derivative of the world and for which you will also be automatically considered if you are eligible. But this follows uh, its own also methodology. So you're more than welcome to also request the methodology from us if you have interest in that. <clears throat> the second global ranking uh, and very influential ranking is the impact rankings launched in 2019, uh, which assesses how well universities are contributing to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, we collect data for all 17 SDGs and we collect three types of data to assess performance in these goals. First of all, we look at continuous data. So things like the number of students, we also consider sometimes energy spent, area, graduation rate, everything that could be relevant for these SDGs. Second, we collect evidence data for policies and initiatives. So it really, it's really important as part of the impact rankings to understand how the university is really trying to achieve these goals and the programs that it's setting up to achieve them. And in order to do that, we do consider some evidences, which could be policies or sometimes public uh, links, uh, websites that showcase the work of your institution. And finally, we also consider publications data, also via Elsevier, that uh, informs us on the research that your institution is creating and contributing to in those uh, development goals. Now, there are four broad areas that we assess the performance of your institution for each SDGs. So first of all, as I just mentioned, we look at research. So for instance, in industry innovation and infrastructure, we would be looking at the research that your academics are producing in that field how well this research is cited, but also how well it sits and performs compared with the rest of the world uh, research in that field. 
The second way we assess the performance of your institution is through outreach and the impact that you're having on the society. So for SDG 9, again, that could be through the uh, looking at the number of patents that are citing your research or the number of spin-offs uh, spin that are originating from your institution. The third area or way to assess uh, your institution's contribution to change in that area is stewardship. So if we look at uh, SDG 10, which is reduced inequalities, one way to measure that is to look at the measures and policies that your institution has implemented to combat discrimination and ensure that your campus is inclusive. And finally, the last way is through teaching. So we look at the percentage or proportion of students of staff with disabilities and how well your institution is being inclusive to so those social groups that might be minorities. The participation procedure is similar to the word, so you also need to nominate a data provider that is authorized by your institution. That data provider will be connected to the portal and submit data usually between September and November, and that is when the portal is open for those rankings. Uh, the type of data that is collected, as mentioned, includes evidence and continuous data, and uh, you have the option to participate in any of the 17 SDGs. However, in order to be eligible for the overall impact rankings, you need to submit data for SDG 17, which is partnership across the goals and is an SDG that is really important to measure the overall performance. And on top of that, at least three other SDGs. Finally, the only requirement here is really submitting valid and sufficient data, but there are no specific requirements regarding um, the number of the publications. The last rankings I want to mention today is the Sub-Saharan Africa University rankings. Uh, it's a very recent ranking. It hasn't been launched yet. We are launching it for the first time in June uh, next month. Uh, we collected data for this ranking for the first time earlier this year. Uh, uh, earlier, sorry, um, in late 2022, in fact. Uh, the rankings was, was created in partnership with the MasterCard Foundation and it was developed by a consortium of African uh, universities and Ghana-based Ashesi universities and, uh, of course, uh, THE's data team and experts in rankings were managing the whole process to produce a ranking that is relevant for the region. Uh, the ranking combines uh, some of the core missions of universities with the um, Sustainable Development Goals and African Union's Agenda 2063 to really reflect uh, the needs and the features of the regions and what is relevant for the region in particular. We're looking at five pillars here, resources fine and finances, access and fairness, teaching skills, student engagement and Africa impact. So you can see here, here the combination of uh, traditional university missions alongside more uh, sustainability related missions. Uh, similarly, to participate, you will need to email the relevant email address at our for our team. The portal will be opening again for the next cycle in early 2024. And uh, you can expect to submit three types of data. Apologies. Uh, you can expect to to see three types of data in the rankings, continuous data and evidence for policies and initiative, which would be uh, submitted by your institution, and the biometric data, which is collected directly via us here. Finally, uh, for this ranking, we also run a student survey in collaboration with the university. So if your institution finds that uh, ranking relevant and interesting, then it's also helpful to prepare for that uh, in advance to make sure you have sufficient student responses. Now that we've looked at the rankings that we have, uh, let's take a look at the trends and changes in those rankings over time. Now the main trend that we see over the years is really the growth in participation and the number of universities appearing in those ranking tables. You can see that clearly in the World University Rankings. Uh, where we see a growth from over 1,100 universities in the table in 2018 to almost 1,800 universities in 2023. And that growth is also happening in the subject rankings, where for physical sciences, 
for the World University Rankings 2023, over 1,300 universities were ranked. The impact rankings also witnesses this growth. So for, from 2019 to 2022, we can see growth for each SDG. So you can see in this graph, we're looking at a number of participating universities in each SDG for 2019, uh, 2020 and 2021. Uh, apologies, uh, you can see that for 2020, 2021 and 2022 for each SDG. And you can see clearly there is an upwards uh, growth trend for every single one of them. In 2022, we achieved over 1,500 universities submitting data for the impact rankings. So what we're doing really to accommodate for this growth, but also to ensure that the rankings are still relevant and measuring what they're supposed to measure in light of this growth is continuous consultations with the advisory boards of these rankings to make sure that we're delivering the, the missions and the measures that we uh, want to. Uh, the most significant change we had recently was for the World University Rankings. And you can see here a history of the changes over time to keep up uh, with the growth uh, and also changes in, in the, uh, the sector as well. Um, the most significant ones you can see is in 2016 when the ranking was brought in-house and we started to collaborate with Elsevier to source the biometric data. And we're going to talk uh, in a bit uh, regarding the importance of this data coming from Elsevier, which is a question, a question that we get commonly. More recently, in 2023, uh, the reputation, or for the World University Rankings 2023, the reputation survey was brought in-house, which resulted in a large expansion in the number of academics participating, making this reputation survey more and more representative of the entire world. And finally, uh, for the World University Rankings 2024, which will be published later this year, we're introducing major methodology changes to enhance the bibliometric and research measures. Uh, another way to keep up with the changes and to make sure again that the rankings are very reliable, uh, given this number of institutions that we have, is by looking at uh, stronger data validation and data verification processes. Part of that would include for all continuous data, comparing that data against previous submissions, against similar universities, looking at statistical extremes and flagging them. And finally, and we're introducing that more strongly every year, looking at, at external sources. We look at government data sets, public data, and any other data sources that we can find to ensure that your institution's data is reliable and consistent for the rankings. For evidence-based submissions, on the other hand, so any evidences that your institution submits, whether for the impact rankings or the Sub-Saharan Africa University rankings, THE will be evaluating every single evidence, uh, looking at how well it answers the question and scoring it accordingly. Now that we've spoken about the trends that are happening, uh, I think we've spoken a lot about uh, quality research and its impact on the rankings, but that was also one of the main questions that uh, was brought up uh, by people who are in this webinar. So I thought it's good to include a, a little section on that. Uh, now, of course, quality research is very important to uh, THE, and this is one of the main reasons that we uh, source all of our data regarding publications from Scopus, which is uh, Elsevier's database on publications and citations. And the, re the reason we do that is that Scopus is the world's largest curated abstract and citation database. It has a very strict content selection policies uh, and it employs really uh, high quality technology to ensure that it keeps us with, it keeps up with all publications regularly and provides reliable data. Uh, some of the these selection policies that Scopus has in place to make sure that the data is of high quality or the journals and publications considered are high quality is making sure that journals are peer reviewed, they are published regularly, they are relevant and readable by an international audience, meaning that they have to include an English uh, abstract and title. 
And finally, uh, the journal has to have a publicly available publication ethics and malpractice statement. Again, this summarizes uh, why it's really important for us to, to uh, why we do really use the Scopus data set and the quality of that database. Um, in the world university rankings, quality research has a very important impact and it impacts seven out of the 17 metrics used in the world university rankings. Now, the slide summarizes this, uh, but we can see it better when we look at this uh, presentation of the methodology, uh, which shows us again where the data, which data impacts the rankings and how. So you can see again in red, you can see on the left uh, part of, of the picture, you can see reputation survey data and how it contributes to the rankings. You can see university submissions. And finally, you can see bibliometric data and you can see it contributes to the biggest proportion of um, weights in the rankings, 37.25%. And again, seven metrics out of 17 total. Um, just a reminder that this is the methodology for the ranking that will be published in uh, September. So this is the new methodology. For the impact rankings, it also has a very significant impact. Uh, each uh, SDG has its own query that was created by THC and Elsevier to make sure that we consider all publications that are relevant for each SDG. And we can see as a result of that, we have a large number of publications that are considered with over 2 million publications considered for SDG 3. Now, the reason this number is very large is because this is the Good Health and Wellbeing SDG, which includes a lot of medical papers. But then next after that, we see uh, also over 700,000 publications in affordable and clean energy. So there is a very large database that we're looking at here. And for each SDG rankings, there is at least two bibliometric measures. So again, this demonstrates the importance of quality research by your institution on your performance in the rankings. Now, finally, we have um, a specific section to discuss the success stories in the region, but also compare how the region is performing compared with the rest of the world and what are the ways or the fields in which uh, there is um, room for improvement. Now, the first and clearest success story is really in terms of the numbers that we're seeing. We're seeing a significant growth from the region in terms of universities participating. So the graph that is on the left hand side of the screen uh, shows us the overall number of universities participating in each country that are um, not all countries, but just the main countries in the region or biggest uh, participating countries in the region. And you can see from 2019 to 2023, uh, Turkey has an increase from a little over 20 universities to over 60 universities being represented in the rankings. Pakistan also witnesses a very in a significant increase, uh, almost doubling or even more from 10 universities to almost 30 universities participating. And for all other major countries in the region, there is a significant upwards trend. And now we can see better how this compares with the rest of the world in the right and the graph on the right, where you can see proportionately the incremental increase in those numbers. So you can see uh, for the world, uh, this dotted line in black shows you the increase from 2019 to 2023. And you can see for those regions, uh, the proportionate or incremental growth is uh, higher than the rest of the world. Nigeria is at the top of um, the list here uh, because it, it went from very few universities in 2019 to um, a lot more in 2023. But even countries that have a lot of universities, such as Pakistan, Algeria, and um, Turkey, are also experiencing significant growth over the years that is definitely larger than the rest of the world. But what that really tells us is that the region is on a route to really be more and more representative, represented in those global rankings. Now, what's even more interesting here is 
is when we look at the scores and the actual achievements and ranks that universities in the region are achieving. Now, this analysis or graph shows us uh, a number of countries where the scores are increasing the most uh, over the last few years. So from 2019 to the World University Rankings 2023, what are the countries where universities are having the most significant increase in scores? And Nigeria comes at the top of our list here with the uh, enhances in scores by the University of Lagos and uh, Covenant University. Next up, we have the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia. Uh, also, we have uh, more universities from these regions coming into the top 300 and top 200, which is a significant achievement. Pakistan, Egypt, Jordan, and then finally Iran. So you can see universities, there are seven out of the total top 10 universities uh, experiencing growth in, the, in their ranks and scores, seven out of them are located uh, in the region. What's also important to consider is uh, what are the metrics or pillars in which the region is performing well and where there is room for, importance, uh, for uh, enhancement. So you can see overall, both Asian and African universities uh, perform less than the world average. However, uh, in, certain much, in certain pillars, this performance is closer or sometimes even higher than the world average. So for Asia, we can see in teaching and research, it performs pretty close to the rest of the world. In industry, it even outperforms the rest of the world. And this can be traced, in fact, to a few countries where uh, there, there's more industry income, which is leading this growth, really. Uh, so it really depends on a case-by-case -case basis, but we can always provide more insights into these specific cases. On the other hand, Asia uh, doesn't perform as well as the rest of the world in citation and international outlook. So these are the metrics that we know Asian universities might be able to work on to enhance their representation and ranks over the next few years. On the other hand, we can see Africa uh, really stays behind in uh, teaching and research compared with the rest of the world. Uh, this is likely due to the reputation metrics, which, uh, as I've said previously, are mostly impacted by, first of all, the performance of the university, but also the age and the time for which the university has been publishing and leading in teaching and research. So some of these answers could be long-term plans, really. But it's, it's good to be aware, of course, like of the, the areas in which there is room for improvement. On the other hand, Africa has a, a performance that is closer to the rest of the world in citation and international outlook. Now, moving on to the impact rankings, also significant success stories in terms of participation. Uh, one of the main um, advantages we have here is the fact that we don't have limitations on uh, the number of publications required by universities to participate, which really uh, showcases how the universities that are located in the region are eager to participate and they're really submitting quality data here. So we can see there's significant participation from countries like Pakistan, uh, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Algeria, all of which are countries that are submitting data for the impact rankings and appearing in the rankings. And more and more growth is also experienced every year. Uh, another thing that we can consider for the impact rankings is also the scores. So what are the SDGs in which countries in the Middle East tend to perform well? And we can see here that uh, SDG3 has the highest score among the Middle Eastern universities compared to the other SDGs. Uh, again, this is uh, good health and well-being. Universities in the Middle East also tend to perform really well in SDG 17, which is partnership across the, the goals. So there is, this demonstrates that there is a lot of work across the entire 17 sustainable development goals. Uh, the areas where these universities are falling back include uh, sustainable uh, climate action uh, goals and the relevant rankings. 
and also gender equality with uh, SDG 5. So these are the SDGs where your institution or the, the region in general uh, might look at improving over the next few years. But again, these performances can really differ from one country to the other, but also can be different from one university to the other within the same country. Finally, uh, an interesting success story that is leading actually the growth in the world university rankings and will be also in fact impacting the scores received there is the changes in the publications made. So we can see over time, and particularly I'm looking here at Pakistan and the United Arab Emirates, uh, there is a very clear positive trends in publications, but also the impact of these publications. So the top two graphs show us the number of publications and the citation impact of publications in Pakistan. You can see in 2018, this was almost around 20,000 publications across the country. And this doubles by 2022, or even more than doubles by 2022. So this really showcases that there is a lot of work that is being done in the region to enhance the research made and the quality of this research. Uh, but on the, on, the, on the other hand, we can see that even the impact of this research is, is important. So this isn't just research with low quality, it's actually research that is also driving up the field weighted citation impact. And we're witnessing what this means, in other words, is that these, these publications are being well cited um, and showing here uh, almost a little over one uh, citation impact in 2017 to almost a little over one and a half and what this really means is a comparison with the rest of the world so one is the global average uh, when we see a country performing over one that means it's performing above the world average in terms of citations and the upwards trend the trend is very clear here the same applies or a similar concept applies to the United Arab Emirates. We, we can also see a growth in the number of publications from around uh, 6,000, 7,000 in 2017 to around 16,000 in 2022. So very uh, clear engagement in terms of research, but also the impact of the, this research and the number of citations received is also enhancing leading to a bigger citation impact over the years. Now, I hope that these slides uh, have given you an idea about our rankings, and I really hope to hear from some of you who might be interested in taking part over our uh, email addresses, uh, which you can use to email us about any questions, but also if you would like to participate. Uh, I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, uh, Lokesh, who's going to be answering some of your questions and you might be able to ask some questions live as well. Thank you very much, Lubaba, for that very informative and, uh, and excellent presentation. Um, now, thank you as well very much to all the participants who submitted uh, their questions. We built the presentation, Lubaba built it in a way where we were aiming to answer the vast majority of those, but we have taken some, we have selected some that we felt needed a little bit more elaboration as well. Um, so I'll be going through those. And then hopefully we also have some time for any live questions that you may have. But rest assured as well, any, any other questions that we may not have time for today, we'll look into them and we'll send those answers as well with our follow-up as well. Um, so on to some of the questions. We had one that was quite interesting around um, what library teams, I, I realize we have a lot of librarians today as well today and, and many people from the library team. So it was around what library teams and those teams that are in charge of the data analysis and the data submission what they can do to contribute to the overall ranking of the university and what specific factors are uh, related to that, such as research, resources, services and facilities that could help impact the ranking. So we've taken a look at this and really um, we, have, we have some tools available, how Nick was saying earlier in the presentation, that can support specifically these teams when it comes to data collection, data submission, and data analysis um, and we, we call these tool uh, these suite of tools we call it data points and essentially it is built for these teams in order to support with that data collection process that data submission and most importantly also that data analysis when it comes to rankings 
um, so that universities are able to compare their performance to their selected peers as well to see where there are certain strengths, where there are certain areas for development um, within that data that is submitted to keep on improving year on year with that submission and with that ranking as well. And of course, those, those tools are very much um, catered based on the different rankings. Um, so for example, for the Arab rankings, we have a regional dashboard called the Arab dashboard. And for the impact rankings, for the sustainability ranking, rankings, there's a specific impact dashboard as well, where you can see, um, you know, as Lubaba was saying earlier, those policies and those pieces of evidence that universities have to submit towards the rankings, you're able to see what other universities have submitted, the top ranked universities. So it really helps those teams with that submission process. And of course, if you'd like more information around that, or if you'd like a demo of any of those dashboards, we can, we can definitely arrange those um, in these weeks to come as well. We had a next, the next question was more so around interdisciplinary research. Uh, and it was specifically asking, could rankings recognize universities that foster interdisciplinary research and innovation by considering the number of interdisciplinary programs, joint research centers, and interdisciplinary publications? Um, a very interesting question because actually just this year um, in, in our reputation survey, we started asking questions around interdisciplinary research. And this is the first time we identified it as an area of high importance. Uh, it has come up as a really hot topic in higher education over the last few years. And so now we're in that initial phase of gathering as much data as possible from universities around interdisciplinary research so that we can start to analyze that, start to build some, um, some analysis and some trends around that, um, so that in the future, potentially, we could have either some inclusion within the rankings around that, or potentially something separate, uh, which ranks universities around their interdisciplinary research. But that's an area on which to, to stay posted. We will we'll keep you informed as to and when we have more developments around that area. For now, we're in the data collection process um, and it's slightly in the earlier phases, but a really good question that was raised as well. The following question is around um, university consortiums and whether they have any impact on rankings. Um, and around this topic, um, our rankings are developed independently. Uh, earlier, we saw how that journey has, has gone through over the last years. And whenever there's any change in the methodology of the rankings, uh, the reasoning behind it is to keep the rankings as robust and uh, as reliable as possible um, and specifically also as uh, relevant to each different uh, area geographically or to the nature of the university. So whenever changes are made in the methodology, they're always done in consultation with um, our advisory board. So we have a series of advisory boards for the different rankings and they're done in consultation with that advisory board. Um, but specifically consortiums and any consortiums that a university may be a part of don't have an impact on the rankings. And then there was a, a very good question around, um, you know, are there ways aside from the rankings that we, that we celebrate success and award universities? So the specific question was, do we have any international awards aside from the rankings? Um, and the good news is that we do. We do have these um, because we appreciate that rankings cannot capture every uh, success that a university has. And there are many successes outside of the data that we collect for rankings. And as such, we have um, the THE awards. Uh, they were started years ago for UK universities. Um, I, I believe three or four years ago, they transitioned to the Asia region as well. So we have the Asia uh, THE awards. And this year, for the first time, we're going to be launching the THE Awards for the MENA region, which will be celebrated uh, in November this year in Abu Dhabi in partnership with um, NYU Abu Dhabi. And uh, the good news is that the submission for these awards is still open. There's only a short window left. They close on the 15th of May. But we do encourage you to take a look at the, at the site. We will send it in our follow up. And we do encourage you to, to submit um, your, your submission. It can be, it's, there are a range of categories. 
uh, around student recruitment campaign of the year, to the leadership and management team of the year, to the most innovative practice. So it really celebrates success across different areas within the university. Um, and this is something which we felt was very important to bring to the MENA region since um, there has been so much great development over the last few years in the region. Um, we'll open up now uh, and take a look at any of the live questions that are coming in. Um, so if you can bear with us one second, we're just going to take a quick, quick uh, look at these and try and answer any questions that you have coming in as well. So I believe it would be it, sorry, thank you. Yeah, and um, I'd just like to add before we go into the live questions for our attendees, if you would like to receive the Times Higher Education presentation that has been uh, presented in today's webinar, then please provide your marketing consent, which you will find now as a poll, uh, so that Times Higher Education can communicate uh, in the future to send you the presentations or answer any of your questions. Thank you very much, Nadine. Um, we're just trying to go through these. Um, bear with us on, one second. Um, how do we expand this? Ah, there we go. Okay, brilliant. Now we can see all the questions. Yeah. Hi, Lokesh and Nick. Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you as well. Thanks for being so welcoming. <laughs> okay. Um, how is an institution ranked? Do you identify the university or a certain university apply to be ranked? Um, so I think that's, that's been answered in, uh, uh, yeah. in the Baba section around uh, data submission. So it's open for it's open for universities to to nominate a, a, a data submitter. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the request for that goes to profile at times uh, profile rankings at timeshighereducation.com. So if there's an institution that hasn't been ranked and you would like to begin that process, then please do email uh, profile rankings at timeshighereducation.com, and we will set you up with access to uh, log into the portal once you send us the information of who is your designated data submitter, and that's how the process begins. And I can confirm that. Uh, we don't usually, so for all of the rankings that were mentioned in the presentation, we do need the university to actively submit their data. We cannot rank universities if they haven't submitted. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding publications, do you mean published articles or institutions' own journals? So what we consider uh, when we say publications is five types of publications. We look at books, book chapters, articles, uh, conference uh, article reviews, and conference proceedings. This can be published in a journal. Well, typically it, it's in a journal, but again, if it's a book, it's independent. But what's really important is that this is um, indexed in the Scopus database and recognized by Elsevier. And some of these institutions own journals. If they are peer reviewed, they meet the Elsevier um, criteria. They could be indexed there. How much does uh, do the publications uh, weight in the ranking, or what is what is the weight of the publications in the rankings? Uh, this really depends on the ranking that we're looking at. So in the World University Rankings, we look at, at how bibliometric data accounts for 37.25% of the entire score. Uh, in the impact rankings, that will depend on the specific sustainable development goals that you're participating in. So uh, we encourage you to take a look at the methodology, but you can also ask us by email uh, if you have a particular SDG in mind. And finally, the Sub-Saharan Africa University rankings, we're going to be publishing the methodology around the launch time in June. Okay. Um, yes. So, uh, do you want to go ahead? To All right. So, the question is: Those 500 publications in the Arab University rankings must be in ISI or Scopus indexed um, journals or any other. So, no, it's, that's right. It's it's Scopus uh, indexed journals only. 
Okay. I think that is the last uh, question that I can see so far. We have another question. So if, so if publications are not in Scopus, it means that they're not counted at all. Uh, at, yeah, that's the case. That's that's correct. We, 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 as Rubaba was saying, we went with Scopus. We chose Scopus due to our partnership with Elsevier, but as well because uh, in, in our understanding, it is one of the largest and most inclusive um, you know, index journals, sorry, the libraries for indexing journals that we that we have. I think it's probably fair to, to point out as well, for the Arab rankings, we have considered a secondary bibliometric data source to look particularly at Arab publications. Um, this is still under review and will be up for discussion with the advisory panel as well, um, as we would like to get a greater representation of research in the region. Uh, is there a measure, any measure, to prove the ethics and malpractice statements, reliability of any Scopus Index journal publications? Um, so yes, all of these statements will be uh, likely recorded by Scopus themselves. Again, we source the biometric data from them, but um, ultimately they are the provider for this data and they are the institution that really collects and indexes those journals. Uh, so for these specific questions, uh, I think we could reach out to Elsevier. We do also have like um, an email address that specifically addresses uh, rankings related questions at Elsevier, which we can also share with you if, if you are interested. Right, so the next question, do you still partner or collaborate with QS uh, ratings and what are the main differences between THE and QS? Uh, so to answer the first part of the question, uh, that stopped, uh, I believe it's shown in the methodology timeline uh, I showed earlier. Uh, that was, the, that partnership was for the first few years of the ranking, but it stopped since 2011. So the World University Rankings 2020, 2011 uh, was produced uh, by THE and Thomson Reuters at that time, but now it's, it's fully by THE. Now, regarding the main differences between THE and QS, uh, Nick, do you want to address that? Uh, sure. Thanks for, for passing that one over, Lou Baba. Um, the rankings are, are relatively different, so I think QS is, although they have made updates this year as well, still relate more closely to perhaps the first iteration of the World University Rankings that was produced back in 2004. Um, QS have some, some certain benefits looking at employer reputation, which is something that THE currently don't, but we'd like to think at THE that our ranking is uh, more discreet. We certainly look at more, um, more metrics. Uh, and we like to think that it's slightly more robust as well in the way that we collect data, particularly reputational data. But uh, the one thing that we, we always say is use whatever ranking works best for you. We understand that these are huge promotional tools. So as much as it pains me to say it, if you feel you're performing better in QS, shout about it, do it, you deserve it. But please also speak to us and we'll see how we can make sure you're doing better in THE as well. Next question is, um, what is the best criteria and information which play an important role for ranking in the in THE? Um, so I think around the, around the weights uh, for the metrics, how Lubaba was saying earlier, the two across the different rankings, the two, the two ones that hold the most weight are around reputation conducted in the academic reputation survey for teaching reputation and for research reputation. And then of course, around the bibliometric data as well. So the citations and, and the different metrics related to those. Those are the two that hold um, the largest weight, really, um, to answer that question. Okay, I'm just going over the next question, which is a little bit young, uh, longer. Mm -hmm. Student outcome is the indicator of student performance. Hence, it's the successful career placements of students from a particular university uh, over a period of time. I'm really sorry, I'm having problems um, viewing the whole question. Um, taken in the university rankings, if not, what may be the reasons? Okay, um, so I believe the question is around whether we consider university or placements uh, for graduates. 
Uh, now we do not have at the moment a measure for that directly uh, for in, in our current rankings uh, for exactly what has been mentioned, which is a career progression um, or you know the, the career basically outcome uh, for those students. Uh, this is one of the things that is really difficult to measure, even among universities themselves. This is a question that is constantly raised in the data team, uh, and we are continually looking at that and the way to represent this. Uh, at the moment, it still proves to be difficult, even for universities themselves, to really track that. Uh, but we're looking at that again, um, and we do have measures that are closer to that or try to measure that in a way through the impact rankings and the sub-Saharan Africa University rankings. We have questions on student placement uh, in order to see how well the university is helping with career progression. Um, I believe it's two o'clock, uh, so I'm going to hand over to Nadine. Okay, um, thank you, Nick. Thank you, Lubaba. Thank you, Lucas, uh, for the impressive uh, presentation. Uh, I'm sure that our attendants, our attendees have benefit, uh, benefited a lot and a lot of their uh, questions have been answered. I can see that we still have many questions, but unfortunately the time is not really fitting to go through uh, all of them. Uh, as we mentioned uh, in the beginning, please provide your marketing consent so that Times Higher Education can uh, communicate through emails to answer uh, your questions and to send the presentation uh, that you've seen today. Um, so, yeah, um, like I mentioned also, the webinar will be launched on our YouTube channel uh, later for everyone to view as well. And that's it. Thank you, everyone, and have a nice day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.